Welcome back everybody to another uh, lecture here in History 1301 and today we're going to be going over the topic of the formation of the U.S. Constitution. Now as alluded to in the end of the last lecture, while it was one thing for America to win its independence, it was another thing to ensure that in the days after the Revolutionary War that the new government that they presented would run smoothly. Because many over in Europe believe that the American experiment would collapse within if not a few decades within a few years after the end of the Revolutionary War. And we will see how America will struggle to win its last great fight of the Revolution to ensure that the legacy of that Revolution would live on and they would not fall back under European control. Now to begin this topic, I want to turn our attention back to the end of the Revolutionary War. It comes to an end in September of 1783 to where we saw the establishment of the Treaty of Paris. The word of it won't arrive back in the States until October but it will have major effects. And the American colonies were jubilant. But the question was, as we emerge out of that conflict, what was the nation to look like in the peace years? There were many who believed that the American, uh, the American um, or this new American nation should basically become a monarchy. And all eyes will begin to center around what George Washington will do. Now, George Washington was the head of the Continental Army. He led American forces, to victory, or American forces to victory at Yorktown, and basically had won the revolution. And if he wanted to, the American people would have crowned him king. However, he's going to do something that was unprecedented, not just in American history, but in world history. When being presented with power, he's going to reject it. And on December 23rd, 1783, before the Continental Congress, he's going to relinquish his sword and step down and resign. And this was huge, because he effectively ensured that this new government, this new nation, after their victory in the revolution, it would be a government not of a dictator, not of a king, but rather a government of the people. But the question was, how would the people govern? Well, many Americans believe that now that Washington had made it clear he wanted to retire and did not want to become a king, that they would continue to be governed by these series of documents that had governed them during the revolution. That of the Articles of Confederation. Now, the Articles of Confederation, they had been first adopted in 1777 and not ratified until 1781. But it created a government that held the nation together during the Revolution. But it was not a strong government. Under the Articles of Confederation, Confederation think of it as this. You did not have one solidly uni unified nation, but rather 13 independent states. That If there was ever a peace, they had to each create their own peace treaty with a separate nation. On top of that, the only real branch established with the Articles of Confederation within the federal government, that of the uh, legislative branch, it had no real power. The Congress, while they could recommend tra taxes, while they could call on troops to perhaps provide troops for the federal military, these were only recommendations. The states had to dictate whether or not they would actually do this. And as you could probably guess, many of them are not going to want to listen to this federal government because many Americans were suspicious of a strong centralized government. So basically, Continental Congress has no authority to do anything. And this proves crucial, especially in the days after the American Revolution, because they have to address this issue of debt, because America was nearly bankrupt after the Revolutionary War. Now, the Articles of Confederation, even during the war, it became prevalent that they were not a good constitutional document, mainly because since the fact that the government could not raise its own revenue, produce its own taxes, they cannot pay their own soldiers, and there will be a series of mutinies as well as conspiracies that will occur all throughout the revolution, and that would only precurse the years afterwards. And the Articles of Confederation would prove to be a huge humiliating document for the American Republic because, we'll see, even within those 13 states themselves, after, even though they were loosely collected through the Articles of Confederation, they could agree on nothing. And even to create any sort of resolution through the Articles government, all 13 states had to agree to it. And as you can probably guess, not all 13 states are going to agree to a law. There are going to be those who will oppose it. And so virtually nothing was getting done. Something that Hamilton, or I should say Alexander Hamilton and James Madison, will constantly complain about. We'll see that the Articles, they would prove to be the basis for discontent within the states. And shortly after, we see the revolution come to an end. These states that had been united in their effort to expel the British were beginning to fight against one another. Once again, they viewed themselves as 13 independent nations as opposed to one independent nation. And they will quickly begin to dispute over where their borders would lay, especially out in Western territories. Now, I can talk a lot of crap about the Articles of Confederation and why they're so bad, but 
There is one area that they will somewhat resolve the issues between the states and they will prove to be somewhat of a success. And that is in regards to land policy, where the articles would try to address that major issue of debate between the states. Now, in regards to land policy, each one of the 13 states, they believe they had rights out to the land out west. If you were to look at a map that was dictated by the various uh, states within the United States at the time, they believed that their borders just extended all the way to the Mississippi River with all that land they had acquired as a result of the Treaty of Paris. And this had led to a lot of infighting. And as a result, there were some border disputes that could boil over into full out wars between each one of these states, tearing apart the new American nation, or potentially tearing apart the new American nation. However, in one of the few aspects that the Articles of Confederation had control over, they will be able to avoid much of this fighting and solve, at least for the foreseeable future, the issue of border disputes. Now, in regards to the Articles of Confederation, the federal government, while it did not have any authority over issuing taxes or its own currency, it does have authority over land policy. Because all those lands that had been acquired as a part of the uh, Treaty of Paris out to the west of the Appalachian Mountains, they were considered a part of the public domain. And the public domain fell under the authority of the Articles government. And to resolve these disputes, there will be a series of land acts that would be produced to try to resolve this border crisis between the various states. And most notably of those would be, or of these uh, acts that would be pushed forth, would be that of the Northwest Ordinance. Now, through each one of the land acts before the Northwest Ordinance, and including the Northwest Ordinance itself, the federal government's basically going to determine that these Western states, they were not property of the original 13 states or the 13 colonies, but rather they could become their own independent territory with their own independent legislature and government, and eventually they had a pathway to statehood. And what will establish that pathway to statehood, which would carry over to the U.S. Constitution, would be that of the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, which would establish a three-step process on how these territories could become a state, to where once they reached a population of 5,000, they could uh, elect a territorial governor or gain a territorial governor. Once they reached a population of 60,000, they could vote on their uh, own constitution to become a state and eventually send off that constitution to Congress to where it could be voted upon and they could enter the state or enter the Union as a new state to be treated equally as those states that were made up the original 13 colonies. And this was a major victory for the Articles of Confederation. However, outside of land policy, the Articles of Confederation are going to be a complete failure for several reasons. One, in regards to debt, that issue won't be solved. America will be virtually bankrupt under the Articles government because the federal government could not issue its own taxes. They had to rely on the states. Two, the Articles government could not issue its own currency. And we'll see each one of the original 13 states would adopt their own currency, whether it was British pounds, whether they adopted Dutch, Spanish, or French, um, coinage or even created their own currency. And this created an economic nightmare. And on top of that, as the states were fighting over initially over where their borders went, they were also fighting over interstate trade on where tariffs should be established, something that the Articles government could not address itself. And it's because of, no, to no surprise, that in the years after the revolution, there were many individuals who believed that the Articles government should be replaced replaced with a stronger centralized government. Main, the two main individuals who would lead this charge would be that of Alexander Hamilton as well as James Madison. And by 1785-1786, everybody knew that there was a need for a stronger centralized government. Now in 1786, there will be a convention called, a constitutional convention, to revise the Articles of Confederation to grant the federal government more powers. But basically, most states aren't going to send off delegates to this convention because they were uninterested in establishing a stronger centralized government because they were still suspicious that it could turn into basically a tyrannical government. So the question for them was, what should the government look like? And we'll see that James Madison most notably would call for the creation of another constitutional convention to meet the next year. But events are going to greatly change Americans' minds for this call for a new, uh, stronger government. Because up in Massachusetts, there will be a rebellion that will convince Americans that the Articles government was not working. And it would be that of Shays' Rebellion. Now, Shays' Rebellion, breaking out in western Massachusetts, would be conducted by one Daniel Shays, a veteran of the uh, Revolutionary War. Now, Massachusetts itself, just a long story short, it had established its own taxes to pay off its debt. However, those taxes heavily taxed most of those living out on the frontier, mostly average farmers. It did not tax the wealthy, it wasn't progressive, but rather it taxed 
heavily those out living out on the frontier who were relatively poor. And Daniel says about, and about 4,000 individuals were tired of this. They would rise up in, at the uh, end of 1786 to overthrow the Massachusetts government. And the Massachusetts government would call on the Articles government to provide federal troops, but they had no authority to do so. And it was only through luck that the state of Massachusetts was able to suppress this rebellion on their own. But it demonstrated to the American people that a rebellion like this in the future could cause the destruction of the republic as it challenged their authority. And there were renewed calls for the creation of a stronger centralized government. And this is where by early 1787, there would be another issuing out to the states for a new convention to be convened in Philadelphia to discuss the issue of whether or not they should have a stronger government to where they should create a new constitution or revise the Articles of Confederation. Now, when these individuals meet at this convention, they were under the belief that they would merely just uh, revise the Articles. However, very early on, it became prevalent to many delegates that the Articles were crap and they needed to write a new system. So moving on, it become known as the Constitutional Convention. Now at the Constitutional Convention, the main issue that will be at debate is how strong the federal government should be. Because everybody realized that the Articles government was a complete failure and a humiliation. But the question was, how strong should this new government, how strong should it be? Now there will be two individuals who will basically lead the, the debates and eventually lead the formation of the new Constitution. And it will be that of James Madison as well as Alexander Hamilton. However, I'm going to really point out James Madison because he will become the main architect, really, for the uh, Constitution. Now, Madison, a delegate from Virginia, he very much recognized that there needed to be a stronger centralized government. And he would call for, eventually, what would be dubbed the Virginia Plan, where it should create not just one legislative body, but two, and it should create an executive as well as a judiciary branch. And I'll go ahead and I'll write that up on the board, the Virginia Plan. And he would state that if America did not adopt the stronger centralized government, giving more authority to the federal government, the authority to tax, and, and so on and so forth, that the American experiment would eventually fail. He would get the backing of Alexander Hamilton, as well as many other delegates, and he would become known as a federalist. These will be individuals who supported a stronger centralized government, as well as the Constitution. However, while there will be those who will support the Virginia Plan, who would support James Madison, there will be those who will oppose him. Because many feared and were suspicious of a strong centralized government. And they would fall into the other camp, that of the Anti-Federalists, who weren't very content on adopting a new constitution. We'll see several delegates, after hearing this Virginia plan, will walk out simply from the Constitutional Convention, not putting up their own issues to vote. Even though other delegates who would be discontent with uh, Madison's Virginia plan would not just include the Anti-Federalists, but we'd also see a group of delegates coming from the smaller states, because the Virginia plan it was based off of this idea that representation should be the main form of determining how many delegates a state would get to the two houses of the Congress, that of the Senate as well as the House of Representatives that were proposed with the Virginia Plan. And many of the smaller states, states like uh, Connecticut, as well as several others, were under the impression that if they were al allowed the uh, bigger states to have larger representation because of their larger population, that they would not have a big say within the government. And as a result of this, what they're discontent with the Virginia plan, the smaller states are going to convene uh, outside of the Continental Congress to develop their own plan, their counter to the Virginia plan that would become known as the New Jersey plan. Now, the New Jersey plan, it was meant to ensure that these smaller states would have an equal say within the federal government. However, the government that they proposed, it would not be elaborate. It would not have an executive. It would not have a legislative and a judiciary branch. But rather, it would basically replicate the government of the Articles government, to where it had one legislative body, and each state within the union was given one vote. And this is going to create a great amount of deadlock that could eventually lead to the derailing of the Constitutional Convention. However, one Roger Sherman from Connecticut is going to break this gridlock to where he would have a compromise between the smaller and the bigger states to adopt versions of both of these plans. Now, through the Great Compromise, what we'll see is that the government, under the Constitution, once, it's a, uh, once it is put out to the people, it will have an executive branch with a chief executive, which would be the president. It will have a legislative branch with not just one, but two houses of Congress. It will have the Senate as well as the House of Representatives. However, the House of Representatives, its representation would be based off of a state's population, uh, going uh, hand in hand with the Virginia plan. But the other House of Congress, that of the Senate, each state, regardless of their size, regardless of their population, would be given two delegates. 
That way, these smaller states would have a bigger say within that um, house. And this creates uh, checks and balances between both houses of Congress to hopefully appeal to the rights of both the bigger and the smaller uh, states. And then lastly, a part of the Great Compromise and with the Constitution that would eventually be established, you will see that there will be a judiciary branch, which could check the powers of both the other branches and declare laws unconstitutional. Now, this constitution that will be created after we see this great compromise will be issued out to the American people come September of 1787. And I will state while we're talking about the constitution, it has great aspects to it. Because of the fact that we see this very complicated system that was extremely unique, not for American history, but for world history, it ensured that you would have the people, either if they were in the minority or the majority faction, their rights would be protected because of this checks and balances within the system. And that's what will make it so unique and eventually will help it stand the test of time. But even though it does have, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Well, it does have great aspects to it, there are major limitations because with this constitution, it doesn't address what happens to the issue of slavery. It does address slavery briefly. And it states that in regards to counting representation, this idea of the three-fifths clause would be adopted to where three out of every five slaves would be counted towards the Southern population, towards representation. And lastly, another major limitation to the Constitution is it doesn't give women or any other minority group outside of really rich whites the authority to vote. And over time, it'll take further constitutional amendments to address those issues. But nonetheless, it'd be sent out to the states come the end of 1787, and the fight for ratification would begin. Now, even though that we see that the Constitution had been adopted by the delegates within uh, that Constitutional Convention. When it is proposed to the states, it will be a heck of a fight to ultimately get this new Constitution ratified. Because in order for ratification to occur, in order for this to become the law of the land, nine of the 13 uh, states had to ratify this Constitution. And even if you didn't ratify the Constitution, you could be excluded from the nation entirely. And many states, especially delegates who would be represented to their state assemblies who would vote on ratification, were still suspicious of a strong centralized government. Many believed, especially with things like a chief executive, that this perhaps could be a tyrannical government. It was really, in their eyes, uh, mimicking the monarchical system that you would have seen within the uh, British government. And so there will be many who are heavily opposed to ratification, not just within the South or just within the North, but throughout the original 13 colonies. And the Federalists will have to fight an uphill battle to ensure that the Constitution was ratified, especially in two major states, that of New York as well as Virginia. And why are they so significant for the uh, fight for ratification? Because they were the largest states within the Union, and New York was the center of, the, um, of America's trade with New York City. And if they fail to ratify these, uh, doc or the Constitution, then it would prove to the American people that how could a government survive without their existence within the Union? Now, to ensure that not only those states, but all the states adopt the Constitution, we'll see this is where James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, as well as John Jay are going to go out and write what are known as the Federalist Papers to try to convince Americans to accept the Constitution by promoting its merits, by arguing against what the anti-Federalist positions were. The anti-Federalists would protest, stating that under this new Constitution, since there was no term limits for the president, you would have a president for life who would not give up power. However, the Federalists would state that if you did not like the president, you could merely elect him out of office. Outside of that, they would criticize things like a senator serving a term for six year or serving a six year term. However, the Federalists once again would invoke that you had the right to vote them out of office and dictate future policy. Not to mention they would establish that the um, that the uh, role of the majority could also become tyrannical, and that with this elaborate checks and balances system, it would ensure that all rights of the American people would be protected. However, there is one major argument that the Federalists aren't going to be able to counter within their Federalist papers or in the fight for ratification. And ultimately, by accepting a creation of a Bill of Rights, will we see many of the states be convinced to ratify the Constitution? Now, by the summer of 1788, ratification was complete, and the Constitution would go into effect. However, Virginia and New York would be excluded from this, but whenever James Madison, as well as other uh, Federalists, say that they would be uh, okay with the idea of potentially creating a Bill of Rights, this will convince New York and Virginia to adopt the Constitution, legitimizing it and creating a new nation. And the Bill of Rights, it won't be created until the following year, but it will basically be an outline of the basic rights 
to Americans as individuals, giving you the right to free speech, the right to bear arms, and so on and so forth. However, we will see that after the creation of this new government, there was a question. What was to become of this government? Would it survive the test of time? Because while we see it clear today as it's survived almost 250 years, it wasn't the case at the time. Many believed that since it was so unique and complex that it would fall apart, many feared that it would turn into a monarchy. And the question was, in the days moving forward, would this government run smoothly? And we'll see during the Washington, the Adams administration next time, they will look to ensure that this government would stand the test of time and it would not collapse. But we'll talk about that when we get to next week. But anyways, that brings us to an end of lecture over the U.S. Constitution. And um, with that said, Make sure that in the meantime, before the next lecture, that you go out and you uh, read the appropriate articles that go with this lecture, as well as read the corresponding textbook uh, chapter. And then also make sure you complete any outstanding assignments. But other than that, everybody go out, be safe. I'll see you all next time.